Good to go, Lakshmi. Yes. Good afternoon and welcome to Pafi Dialogue. Today we have a very distinguished speaker, Shri Dabu Ravi, Secretary of Economic Relations in the Ministry of External Affairs. And he's going to talk to us about India's economic and commercial relationships. Um, Shri Ravi is one person I've known for over three decades, worked together in several of his capacities. We, I remember we worked together on the first Indo-EU business summit in Lisbon, where the Prime Minister Bajpai was going and we had to put that together at short notice. It's a great honor to have you. He is somebody who can talk about not only diplomacy, but also talk about trade, trade blocks, Europe, WTO, and what have you. And today we have a, a very distinguished participation. We have people from industry, we have diplomats, we have think tanks, we have academia, we have media, and also the association representatives. So welcome, Shri Ravi, once again. And I'm going to hand over to uh, Virat, our vice president, to formally uh, take it from here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. This is Ramu Ravi, Secretary of Economic Regulations, colleagues from the industry, um, former diplomats, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, it's a very proud moment for us to have you here today, sir. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ravi needs no introduction, but as a part of my pleasant duty, I will spend a few minutes discussing his very illustrious and amazing um, career. Um, Mr. Ravi um, has served in various positions, uh, both in India and overseas. He's joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1989 and served in several Indian missions abroad, notably Mexico, Cuba, Brussels in various capacities, uh, during the 90s decade till 2001. For a five-year period from 2001 to six, he served in New Delhi in the Ministry of External Affairs headquarters, first as the Deputy Secretary and then later as a Director for West Europe and UN Divisions. Um, he then went on to serve as the Private Se uh, Secretary to the Minister of Tourism and Culture for a three-year period uh, between March 2006 till mid of 2009. He was then appointed the Joint Secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs responsible for India's relations with Latin America and the Caribbean countries uh, from October 2009 till the end of 2013. And from 2014, uh, for um, a long period, he served almost six years as a Joint Secretary in the Ministry of Commerce, where he handled India's trade policy, including WTO issues such as trade disputes, NAMA, fisheries negotiations, and trade policy review. Uh, this tenure obviously makes him a trade specialist within uh, the Foreign Service, something of tremendous interest to delegates for today's meeting. Um, he's also been part of the Indian delegation to the WTO Ministerial Conference in Nairobi in November 15, and then Buenos Aires in December of 2017. He's had the distinction of handling India's trade and investment relations, several very important regional groupings, such as the G20, BRICS, Commonwealth, SEO, APAC, Indian Ocean Rim Association, the Asia-Europe Meeting, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Notably, he was India's chief negotiator in the mega regional free trade agreement, RCEP. On his return to the ministry uh, in March of 2020, he was appointed as the additional secretary, COVID and Europe to streamline the and coordinate the international as well as domestic efforts of the government to address the rising challenges um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this effort, as you know, is uh, popularly known as Vaccine Maitri, a hu massive humanitarian initiative taken by the Indian government to provide COVID-19 vaccines to countries around the world, which started in early 2021. Uh, he was then appointed the Secretary of Economic Relations in the ministry. Mr. Tamu has also published research papers on trade matters, which include papers on standardization of Indian exports and liberalizing India's agricultural markets. In summary, uh, Mr. Tamu Ravi's tenure has been nothing sort of exemplary. And I'm pretty sure I've missed out some important ones, which he'll have an option to discuss during his keynote. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ravi, for everything you and your team have done. The officers in the government of India, in general, and MEA in particular, have worked around the clock, uh, especially at the time of COVID crisis, the time we in the industry had the opportunity to actually work from home you were in offices keeping the government on its feet. This effort came at a cost of huge sacrifice and went well beyond the call of duty. My colleagues in the industry and I remain deeply grateful 
to the officers in the MEA for their heroic efforts. Um, let me take a minute to introduce Pafi before we invite you for your keynote uh, following uh, by an interactive session. Pafi started in the year 2008 as an informal platform for public policy professionals. In 2012, it was formally registered under the Societies Act. And today, Pafi has around 75 companies and growing as members of the association from various different sector. Pafi is at the forefront of driving ethical, transparent, evidence-based interactions amongst government, industry, media, academia, and other stakeholders in the economy. Our theme for this year, reviving, the <coughs> reimagining, reboot, reform, we believe, and I hope you will agree that in the new economic order, uh, in the post global pandemic, revival will only come after structurally rethinking and reimagining the economy. Given the role of the Ministry of External Affairs and particularly you and your team in furthering and boosting India's economic and commercial relations, we are very fortunate, sir, to have you here as a keynote speaker. Uh, for this year's theme today. And uh, the delegates online represent some of the biggest Indian and global investors that are in India, interested in India, and in particular concerned with issues of policymaking, international relations, and economic development. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to present to you Mr. Dam Ravi. Sir, may I now invite you to deliver your keynote address. Thank you, Virat, uh, for that uh, uh, very elaborate introduction and uh, about me uh, and also thank Ajay for uh, urging me and inviting me to the to to this uh, very prestigious uh, uh, public affairs forum of India to speak. Uh, I mean, for me, this is uh, something new, which I am not very familiar with. Uh, but I'm really delighted to speak to you today. Uh, for more than one reason, because I'm new to the job. I've just taken over as uh, Secretary Economic Relations in the Ministry of External Affairs. So uh, it's the beginning of my tenure here. So I have a lot of ideas to share with the industry, with the think tanks and intellectuals and intelligent people like you are. So that's why I consider this uh, occasion very eminently important for me. So <clears throat> of course, everybody knows about uh, uh, at least in the government and in the in the in the social circles that the public affairs forum of india promotes uh, uh, intelligent way of discussions intellectual discussions and uh, insightful conversations uh, the topic for today is very interesting uh, and i have some kind of background which i would like to share and i like to also learn from you uh, and so that you know as i introduce uh, my my team into the work on various issues, then uh, there I, I will be able to shape uh, their own understanding and take uh, steps ahead. Now, uh, a topic like this, which is very broad, and it concerns all of us. So I believe that it's important to approach it slightly from the past and give a little bit background to it. So uh, I'd like you to draw attention to the seminal works of the eminent British economist, uh, Angus Madison's studies of the world economic history of 2000 years, in which he concluded that India's contribution to the world GDP 2000 years ago was somewhere in the range of 30 to 40%. And this remained consistent till the time of the British rule um, and started to decline. And ironically, in 1947, at the time of our independence, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire was the poorest with contribution to the world GDP of less than 3%. This development in the first half of last century also had impacted the way we promoted our policies. It cast a shadow on our economic policies. Uh, the command economy structure, the socialistic pattern of thinking uh, uh, with a strong role for public sector enterprises uh, was, I think, in everybody's, was not, was everybody's knowledge. Uh, and it was also done for a cost because the overriding concerns of the government at the time was to tackle uh, poverty, poverty alleviation, hunger. These were the priorities. But these policies also unwittingly protected the industry from competition, from outside competition. So it became more inward looking uh, for 
almost 50 years until a landmark 1991 economic reforms, which began to change everything. Thereafter, the Indian economy witnessed tectonic shifts. The public sector enterprises transformed themselves into public private partnerships in the economic building of the economy. Then the public private sector become very, very strong too. Today, after about three decades of the reform, we're seeing a new India. There is no doubt in the minds of the people that India's ability to reach a $5 trillion economy, GDP economy is a reality. And there's nobody who doubts that figure. But it's also important as to how we reach that. 60 years it took us to be a $1 trillion economy, GDP. And the next $1 trillion came in about six years or seven years maybe. So if you are able to uh, reach, maintain high growth rates of almost double digit, it should not be difficult for us to reach a $10 trillion GDP target very soon, maybe in, in a decade's time. The US banking group, City, had recently come out with a study that concluded that by 2050, India will be the largest economy in the world with a GDP of $28 trillion. And in PPP terms, it would touch a record $85 trillion, whereas that of China, it spiked at $80 trillion. This comparison is only to illustrate the enormous size that our economy is going to achieve in the near future. And what it means for all of us and how we need to manage it is a very important uh, aspect of the policy as well as the industry and how it manages. Domestically, there will be challenges in terms of how we manage the interest of the entrepreneurs and the, 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 the social and economic agenda and the aspirations of the people. So that's a need for that kind of uh, balancing role. And to be able to take everybody and to be able to ensure that the fruits of our economy are reaching to a large number of people. On the external front, you will also see that India's engagement with the outside world will naturally enhance because of its economic weight and size. Now I'd like to take you back into a moment of history that at the time of independence, we were always sharing, supporting, the developing countries in their freedom struggle. And the spirit of cooperation is so ingrained in us that when we talk about economic partnerships, cooperation in Africa, in Latin America, we always think that you know it's important for us to share what we have. In the true spirit of the South-South cooperation, where the recipient country determines what are their priorities, not the donor country which is very different from how many other countries deal with their partners. Our support to countries in the form of lines of credit, grants, and India's flagship Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Program for Capacity Building are, are making big impact in many countries. I believe the time has come for us to also see how we can introduce our successful flagship programs like the Aadhaar, the Aishman Bharat, the Ujwala, the Hargar Jal, the Yojana, Covin, Digital India, Atmanirbhar, and the direct cash benefits, which are all transforming our economy and our lifestyles. And in the same way, if you are able to introduce them in our partner countries, it will make a big change. And I believe there is a scope for us to innovatively engage our partner countries in Africa, Latin America, in CIS countries, and within our own neighborhood and extended neighborhood. Africa happens to be my charge, uh, and we are looking at the region with interest, uh, and we want to develop win-win partnerships in an innovative way, uh, uh, and that thinking is ongoing. And of course, I'll be requiring the input from think tanks and industry and how to go about it. 
At the multilateral front, India has always been a strong player. We've been active in the UN and the WTO, the UNCTAD, the World Health Organization, as well as in the plurilateral and regional bodies, such as the G20, the BRICS, the IPSA, etc. Now, our engagement with this, with the outside world so far has been very much in tune with our growing importance, our size, and our weight in the world. But it also gives us an added responsibility in terms of how we wish to shape the narratives. One is that we need to first safeguard our own interests, but at the same time, the narratives that impact humanity also need to be uh, need to be supported with our understanding, uh, not from the developed country's point of view. And of course, to do so, we should be able to create coalitions. We should be able to engage with a large number of countries with like-minded uh, thinking. So that again is a challenge for the economic diplomacy, which is under my charge. So we need to be innovative, not necessarily to take to block or to, to, to avoid discussions, but I think we need to be active in our engagement in the multilateral forum, the regional bodies, so that our point of view is takes a cognizance and takes a, a, rec, a proper recognition, due recognition is given by other member countries. In recent times, India has taken lead in the uh, renewable energies, uh, particularly the International Solar Alliance, that uh, we are taking, taking a lead and has taken a very good shape as an international organization. Uh, similarly, the Coalition of Disaster Resilience Infrastructure, CDRI, is India's initiative, which is assuming uh, an international profile. In the days to come, we would not only need to be active, but we also need to, to think through the issues trade, climate change, energy, nutrition, terrorism, security, all of this are going to be very, very important. And we need to be there and with a large number of countries to ensure that the humanity and the peace and stability is maintained. In the WTO context, we will need to build coalitions with like-minded countries. And for more than one reason, because trade of late is being seen as a profit and loss concept. But in the original conception and the foundation of WTO, the idea was that trade should be a catalyst of development. Because a large number of developing countries need to catch up their lives and livelihood issues of the people in developing and least developed countries would need to be uh, improved. That was the principle. So the principle in the multilateral trade negotiations would need to be maintained. And that is, again, I believe India is eminently placed to, to lead uh, that role. We also need to ensure that the gaps in the rule book of the trade do not lead some countries to resort to dumping of the goods in other countries. I think of immediate concern in the context of the COVID situation is the intellectual property rights where the research and development and sharing of the research and development become eminently important for all of us. So how do we accommodate the interest of those countries which are recipients of the vaccines and who are also developing uh, vaccines and how do we share the research? And this again brings us back to the IPR, the TRIPS chapters and where India and South Africa has taken the lead. But I believe many countries in, would understand the spirit in which we are leading this negotiation in the WTO. I'd like to take you to the uh, another important aspect of how we are looking at trade. Recently, Prime Minister has, has declared or called for uh, boosting exports. We kept a target of 400 billion to be achieved this year which is, I believe is very laudable, considering the fact that we've been stagnating our export around in the range of 300 to $330 billion. This is still a modest number. 400 billion is a modest number. 
given that we have enormous potential. But we need to also look at how we support states in the trade and investment, and their contribution to this target is realized to the fullest. And I believe the Northeastern states present unique opportunities uh, given their own geography and the, and, and, uh, and the potential that have that is there in that part of the world. For us to be more export oriented, our Atmanidbar Bharat itself should be, I believe, more externally oriented. We need to create platforms for last leg manufacturing or assembling of finished products in third countries. And I believe we need to be innovative in this. Countries in, in Africa where can become interesting gateways for our economic engagement in that part of the world. And similarly, we can replicate successful models in Latin America, Caribbean, and uh, CIS countries. Many countries which are resource rich are actually want to graduate to become more industrialized because it creates more jobs. And that is where India need to look at these developments in a more win-win outcomes situations, not merely in, in, the, in, the, in the way we have been experiencing that you go there and gain for yourself, but I think more in the terms of a win-win situation is an acceptable norm. And for this, our entrepreneurs orientation also would need to evolve. And the Minister of External Affairs would be happy to handhold those entrepreneurs which are willing to look at new ways of doing business with Africa. And we have some ideas, uh, and I've been sharing this with industry quite often, both in terms of uh, our lines of credit, the grants, how we want to do that, uh, the ability to provide uh, finance, the Exim Bank uh, uh, financing mechanisms, all that thing, we would like to relook at it and ensure that the industry is able to tap them more effectively for building enduring partnerships outside India. Trade, as we see in a traditional sense of moving goods from one country to another country is somewhat absolute these days because the reality of the global supply chains is so widespread that no country can claim to say that they can produce everything in that country. There is interdependence. Trade is also is deeply integrated in today's world, goods, investments, services, technology, e-commerce are influencing trade in a big way. So we need to understand the complexities and the dynamics at play in trade. The future trade is going to be much more complex with the increasing use of 3D printing, robotic engineering, artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc. But this is where it is. If you are looking at merely in terms of today, the tariffs, then you are still behind. You are, that's past. The trade will be more in the context of IPRs, the royalties, because if a product is manufactured in, within a country, remotely triggered, then there is the tariff will have no meaning. In the same way, we have been talking a lot about the services sector in terms of mode four, but the technology is now telling us that mode one is much more important in the days to come. Friends, these are just views that I would like to share with you, but I'd also like to mention that the new and emerging technologies is an area of my our direct interest in my division. I believe there is enormous scope for us to work on technologies as a green hydrogen energy, which Prime Minister mentioned address in his address during the Independence Day. And renewables in a new concept of biofuels, bio CNG, biodiesels, these are all technologies are already there, but and they have been proven. We need to scale them up. And once we are able to bring this at the industrial level, we will see a new India because I believe energy has a direct linkage with poverty and economic growth. So 
I'm deeply interested in promoting technologies, uh, not only that are there in India, but also able to tap the technologies that are outside India. In many countries that have, have pioneering technologies, India is a big market. And comes with that is the funding also, the green funding that are there, the pension funds that are there. So we are trying to tap, talk to them and bring those resources, technology and resources to India and introduce them to our industry to be able to uh, do uh, uh, those uh, production, manufacturing uh, and harness these new technologies in the country. For enduring partnerships that we require, we need to build, we have to understand how the world is changing. If India, the production links up incentive scheme were to be successful at some point of time, which will, India will become a naturally a global hub for manufacturing. There comes the issue of, are we able to ensure market access for these products? That if India is already becoming in many areas, the automobile components and pharmaceuticals, textiles, and in the days to come with these schemes and the way the infrastructure is growing in the country, there will be a huge opportunity for enhanced manufacturing. So therein comes the trade arrangements. I've been in the trade negotiations, but actually it's important for us to understand the changing dynamics of trade itself. We should be very, very careful that we are not left behind and disadvantaged simply because other groups, other countries are stitching trade agreements to their advantage and leave us behind. So for us to be able to see the big picture, it's important that trade experts, the industry, the policy makers need to work in tandem. We need to see the long-term benefits with a visionary approach while prepared to make sacrifices for now. Friends, it's been a delight to speak to you all. And I believe the future looks very bright for India. And the moment, moment is right. The moment is right for India to claim its rightful place in the global economy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Vish. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Sir. Thank you so much uh, for uh, you know, giving us an absolutely uh, wonderful idea of the various things that you're looking at as Secretary of Economic Affairs. Uh, you know, one one of the things that one enjoyed uh, was the six years that you spent at uh, the Commerce Ministry and having worked with you very closely. I think one learned a lot that uh, you know you look beyond what is the obvious, and uh, which is very clear uh, from the way you're saying you're looking at Africa or how you're looking at some of the other uh, countries and how you're looking at technology uh, as the driving force for our discussions and negotiations on trade. Uh, while I have a few questions here, I'm going to, you know, use this time as a moderator for questions to maybe put a few questions of my own uh, before I move to what the other people are asking for. And my first question to you would be, uh, you know, um, one of the things that's happened is that there's been this call for greater collaboration between the external affairs and the Ministry of Commerce, uh, especially when it comes to, you know, this, uh, discussions on free trade agreements and at the WTO. Uh, you having done both, uh, you know, having spent so much time at the Commerce Ministry uh, and also now uh, here, uh, how do you see that shaping up? Do you see a lot more? Because one does see a lot more of discussions within the MEA uh, on very big issues like the WTO and other areas. How do you see that shaping up and how do you see that can, that can become a reality? Um, thank you, Vish. Uh... Well, this is, uh, I don't want to get into the tough battle with another department of the government, but let me tell you because, uh, my experience. See, um, we always think that the domestic turf is very important for us. And then we've been zealously guarding the domestic turf for many years. The, I think this is also coming from the industry because why we need to at all export when you have such a large market in the country? That's the thinking that's been dominating. Um, since independence and even till recent times, which is why there's a reluctance to open up. In a multilateral setup, you need to naturally give in something to get something. 
So there is always a common denominator, which uh, is in the interest of all the countries. Now, we always, we need to understand, first of all, that if you're taking commitments in the multilaterally, it's not that you're losing anything. You're not, there's a policy space issue that is always coming into to the fore and then telling us, okay, if you take commitment, then you are going to lose a lot. But we need to be innovative. In many times, a policy space is actually a myth. You can, world is changing so much. What is good for you today may not necessarily be good two years down the line or three years down the line. So you need to have that kind of a visionary approach and then take, can take calculated. Now, let's say between the MEA and the uh, Department of Commerce, I don't see any contradiction there. But I think uh, we inputs that come from the industry uh, are very, very important for us to take uh, uh, you know, decisions at the multilateral level in the WTO. So I believe um, greater engagement between the policymakers and industry would help. And we need to encourage that. The industry should actually be driving the policy uh, and then telling us, okay, this is what we need to do together. Uh, and that, that kind of uh, close interaction with industry, looking into the future is a very much, very, very important for us to go together. Thank you. Uh, you know, if I may just uh, go to some of the questions from uh, uh, the people. One of the, uh, one of the questions is from one of the largest beer manufacturers here, uh, who says that he is looking at exporting beer out of India and manufacturing far more here. Uh, but he says he's unable to do so because of maybe a lack of policies and how should he approach this situation? So Akshay from there uh, is asking this question and how would you see this uh, moving forward? How do you, uh, Akshay Gupta from AB InBev has asked this question. So I thought I would ask you this question as to, because uh, you know, beer exports is not something which I don't think we have looked at from India uh, seriously, but he says there's a huge market and we need to look at it. How would you see that? How would you see that? No, well, uh, I wish uh, the uh, item beer, I'm, it's, I mean, a, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm sure will have his priority of what he wants to do. And definitely he's eminently free to do uh, beer or X, Y, Z. There's no problem. Uh, in my view, um, uh, whoever wants to set up a plan uh, of any type, uh, our missions are there. Our ambassadors are today very, very um, business friendly. Uh, they are... Um, uh, it's a red carpet welcome for any Indian investors who want to be there. They, they welcome them with all facilities, uh, conference facilities, meetings. Uh, so that facilitation we can give. Uh, now, beyond that, the mission is also giving the feedback. They are giving the right contacts uh, to the entrepreneurs uh, to be there. And in case there are any troubles, they also address those, uh, those, those problems. Um, now, if he's interested and he has to first plan which country he wants to enter. And he also look at the population there, where is the market size is good enough, uh, politically stable. Uh, and then I think today the financial mechanisms, uh, financing mechanisms are uh, everywhere to able to tap that as well. I think we can, um, ministry, uh, my region, which is Africa that I'm dealing with, we will ensure that he gets full support. Uh, and we have a, a whole team uh, supporting that kind of uh, ideas. So he can write to me, he can write to my colleagues, and uh, we, he can also write to our ambassadors. So rest assured that we will give him all the support. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Ravi. I have uh, Deepak, who's the CEO of Papi, with a question. Deepak, maybe you should ask him directly the question. Deepak, are you there? Thanks, uh, Vish. Uh, so, sir, my question is, how can we use the power, the soft power of tourism along with trade and technology to boost our international economic relations? Well, uh, tourism, I think uh, because of, at this point of time, uh, there's a lot of diffidence in, in, in the tourism sector because of the COVID, uh, where the flights are now... Um, somewhat uh, stopped. Uh, many countries are closing the borders because of this uh, situation. But I believe this is temporary. Uh, yes, tourism has enormous potential. Um, 
both inbound outbound uh, as and when situation improves uh, we should be able to reopen uh, the airlines will start to start, will fly and uh, the tourism will again uh, pick up so we i cannot exactly say how this will uh, proceed from here because uh, we have to see how other countries perceive the situation in india and also how we are perceiving situation in those countries i think the first thing here in the post covid there will be how many countries how many members of the people have really got vaccinated that becomes a crucial question for opening the borders for tourism to proceed but i believe again india is can provide a solution because the manufacturing of medicines is uh, is escalating increasing in large numbers Uh, many companies are collaborating with indian companies and our own indigenous companies are now scaling up the production so we will be able to find solutions for those countries which needs gets vaccinations and also medicines india is a world leader in manufacturing of pharmaceutical products low cost so there again i see a solution so tourism will thrive when people of a country a uh, large number of them are getting vaccinated so that becomes a new requirement for tourism to thrive but we'll keep it open ended at this point <laughs> thank you virat over to you for your question pardon uh, virat bhatia uh, would want to ask a question to you yeah uh, mr ravi i have sort of two questions but you know you mentioned that we've always believed as a country that we are a large domestic economy so why where is the need to open and that kind of point kind of continues in a, in a significant and therefore we've been let's say restricted or not fully open as we would like to be we're about 3. Point, less than 3.5% of the global economy and less than 2% of the global trade so what drives this feeling um even now to some extent that that we are a sufficiently large economy is is there a because the numbers are pretty stark so i thought i'll check with you on what kind of thinking uh, drives that that feeling that we are sufficiently large domestically and therefore international trade is important but not so not recently uh, in the in the speech to the 6th of august to the heads of mission the honorable prime minister spoke about the importance of exports and they did get a whole speech on that but in general uh, i just want to check with you why why is that uh, that feeling that we are sufficiently large when the numbers are quite starkly uh, not that large quite modest in fact yeah so um, thank you uh, if you look at the the economic growth of the country now we are a 2.6 trillion dollar uh, gdp economy which is i believe is a very significant uh, growth given the fact that we were so uh, small in until recent times uh, but again our trade has not kept pace with our economic growth now, that's the reality and uh, why it has happened so because of this thinking in the industry and also in the policy makers that the domestic turf is good enough is is what we need to uh, guard ourselves because if you guard our domestic turf then there's no need for exports but i think it's a very very limited thinking now let's look at it from the way the fdi has flowed since 2000 if you look at that number it's very interesting revelation today it's almost like 750 billion dollars have entered india uh, since 2000 uh but look at the the outflows it's more than 200 billion have gone out of india so what it tells us is that whether you like it or not the industry is looking outwardly also uh, but maybe selectively but i think the fundamental aspect we all know to recognize is that no country can become great unless the industry becomes global and that's where we need to put our heads together how do we make our industry global players Uh, uh uh and then you can do it in various ways in technology infusion you can do in terms of um, joint ventures collaborations yes there is this potential but i think it's the limitation in the is in our own thinking mm-hmm. uh and that's where we need to come out of that uh so if can we ignore the fact that a uh, 5 trillion dollar economy in near future or a 10 trillion dollar can be can remain inward looking it cannot our exports actually are not reflecting the true potential because it remains so constrained by various factors and various forces within the country that's where we need to 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 think and approach it very differently 
and quest not just policy makers but i think uh, the idea should come from the industry and think tanks thank you thank you sir thank you uh, you know one of the things which uh, we really did uh, a lot in, in the ministry of commerce was to work on standards and link it to trade uh, you even wrote a paper on on, on standards if i'm not mistaken that is a very big paper that you've come out with uh, would you like to talk a bit about how standards and trade are linked and from the current position how do you see that uh, helping us uh, in meeting the 400 billion target that uh, you talked about uh, mr prime minister said thank you vishya uh, see the standards yes uh, we've done enormous work on this particular subject um, let's look at the way the world and india looks at standards now tariffs are a very visible barriers you know you raise import duties and then you know that there is an import but standards are very different you know they can be used to raise the uh, uh, the the quality of a product to become more competitive but standards are also raised to as a non tariff barriers to protect their industry that happens um you now many countries in the developed world use this standard very sophisticated it's an unseen walls of uh, of trade barriers you know that are there and you will never know because standard has no particular uh, uh, benchmark in the wto uh, so that's where is the limitation so any country can use a standard and put it as a non tariff barrier against imports into that country we are not uh, we have not evolved to that stage so because um, we believe that if you raise your standards is good but then you can you can still others can match your standards and enter your market but if you encourage the industry to keep raising the standards then qualitatively you'll improve and you become competitive and then you will find market access automatically so the way you play the game is important you cannot and should not i believe it's not a good idea for the industry to look setting up standards to prevent imports standard should be used to raise the quality of the product and prime minister has said zero defect zero effect and so if if you go by that principle we should be constantly looking at and assisting the industry to improve the quality of the product to improve the standards and then naturally you will find uh, a market now we are also seeing around the world a new kind of thinking region standards regional standards now eu will come out has a significant large number of eu standards eu wide region standards so is the asean is coming out with its own standards so what it means to us is that the whole region will become difficult market for you if you don't match if you don't raise your standards so even in the case of asean so even though you might might look very attractive but the whole region will become some kind of uh, a block and and market access uh, challenges you will face because of that so we have to aspire to raise our standards that's very important and the industry should be assisted by the ministries and departments the line ministers particularly looking into these issues thank you thank you uh, i have a few questions on rcep since it was mentioned that you were a negotiator for rcep uh, and the and i'm just going to combine a few of them and ask you a question Uh, the basic idea is that since we haven't signed the rcep as yet uh, you know but uh, given what's happened during covid and you know that we have lost a lot of market and there is prospect of increasing our trade with rcep uh, how do you see our trade with the rcep countries increasing now uh, do you see again any possibility of an fta or uh, do you see that we should do bilateral trade with the other countries well um let me first uh, uh, admit here that well i say that rcep was the lead negotiator along with uh, and my colleague in the commerce ministry at the time uh, as negotiators we don't have any attachment to the outcome because we have a commitment to to do the negotiation in the best interest of the country but whether to do the deal or not it's the political call and the leadership call because the leadership will have to balance various factors and then take a call so i need to make this very clear now let having said that let's understand the whole 
RCEP and how it, it's going to be uh, impacting the trade. We already have FTAs with a large number of countries within RCEP, one of which is the uh, uh, ASEAN, um, Japan, Korea. So there are only about a few countries uh, that India did not have. But RCEP was to be an improvement over the existing FTAs and was to be a, a much more uh, trade friendly um, FTA. But we have to also <clears throat> recognize the fact that when a group of countries are stitching a free trade agreements among themselves, it also means that it's going to be that much more difficult for you to trade with them. Because one, they will be trading among themselves at zero duties. They will be having common standards that you're not part of it, so you cannot uh, be welcomed. Uh, so there will be a trade, trade trade diversion happening. Your potential trade partners will not be able to accept your good unless and until you are yourself going to be unilaterally uh, uh, developing a much more robust trade partnership with those countries. And that's one. Second thing you need to also understand is the continental free trade agreements. That's a very distinct possibility. And I'll tell you why. The CPTPP, which is a mostly a Pacific um, uh, trade agreement of, uh, of uh, countries uh, um, in that region. Um, of course, we, US joining it or not, we don't know, but at this point of CPTPP is a reality. So at some point of time, there could be a, a merger between these two um, at some point of time, because seven members of RCEP are also members of CPTPP. So if you have uh, Asia Pacific or Indo-Pacific trade architecture emerging, that should worry us. We have to be a lot more concerned about how that would impact us and how we can uh, neutralize uh, uh, the, the disadvantage uh, that may uh, befall us at that point of time. So this is again uh, 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 the industry to ponder uh, and uh, guide uh, the, the policy makers uh, in the way they want to see these developments impacting them in the long term and how we need to be competitive and how to get up to these challenges that will, uh, will soon happen in the days to come. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving to Africa, which is of interest to you, uh, you know, there are already some FTAs, regional FTAs within Africa. Uh, and India has also been wanting to and has been talking about uh, greater trade with Africa, which you yourself uh, talked about. Uh, do you see that uh, there is a possibility of any India-Africa uh, you know, trade agreements happening uh, soon? Or uh, are we going to be talking about EU, Australia, and UK for the time being? And how do you see this uh, moving? Uh, well, I mean, that's for the Commerce Ministry to take a call in terms of whether they want it or not. But I think, uh, see, Africa is <clears throat> right now going through uh, some kind of a transition. So there is a talk about a continental FTA first. Yeah. So all the African countries want to arrive at a continental FTA. They need to negotiate that deal first, which means a large number of countries would have to come to an understanding on how they manage the tariffs, how they manage the non-tariff barriers, how they manage the standards and regulatory frameworks. So that's first phase. The second phase is, yes, when that happens, you could look at a uh, continent, India, Africa, FTA. You could look at that, uh, and that would be a very interesting option for us to look at, because then this whole continent would open up. And we also need to understand that many countries in Africa are the least developed countries, the LDC countries who enjoy zero tariffs with developed countries, you know, under the WTO uh, duty-free, quota-free uh, uh, scheme. So that's a very interesting uh, proposition. Uh, and I believe if at all that comes up, we should uh, look, at, look at that uh, possibility more positively. Uh, and then I was mentioning about the need for us to create platforms of, for manufacturing the last leg finished goods, or semi-finished goods being finally assembled there, and that becomes uh, a local product and it easily uh, be able to find markets. And I think the approach should be different for us. Um, 
and that is where again you know ministries commerce industry uh, mea would need to come together as how do we uh, handle that uh, aspect because today africa is want to be industrialized they are very very keen to industrialize those countries because that's an employment generation revenue generation uh, uh, so that is clearly the desire and i believe that india is very well positioned but geographically we are closer and the diaspora is very strong and there is a positive mood for india in those countries because of our own democratic credentials and uh, rule um, <clears throat> um, uh, respect for uh, for rule and uh, freedom of press so there are so many strengths that we we possess that the others value so much so i think um, uh, it it's eminently makes sense for us to give a positive thought if at all this proposal ever comes up thank you uh thank you very much uh, i think uh, we are coming uh, to the time when i to hand over to tanmay to give you a vote of thanks uh you know i was uh, as 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 expected uh, i knew that you would uh, talk a lot about trade because that's an area which has been your area of expertise and uh, at papi we look forward to working very closely with you uh and we hope that we can come in with some ideas on on some several areas that you talked about uh so thank you very much thanks for your time and uh, uh wonderful having this conversation with you over to you tanmay for the vote of thanks thank you so much Thank, thank you. you wish uh, thank you very much wish and a very good evening to you mr ravi it's a delight to uh, seeing you virtually this time we've bumped into each other several times in the past uh, and i think you bring a rare combination of combination of uh, international diplomacy uh, combined with trade and commerce i think that's the kind of combination that uh, is required and you know the kind of uh things that you mentioned about accelerating uh the focus on exports from india to be able to bring world class capability in our manufacturing setup as well as looking at africa as the next destination where there is a natural pull uh in africa of uh, things from india not just things but also services goods and everything else so i think that's a tremendous uh, sense of optimism that you've kind of instilled in all of us uh, in terms of the opportunities that lie ahead you also laid down the kind of uh, road map in terms of uh, thinking inside uh, government in terms of uh, what it believes needs to be the uh, pivotal priorities for uh, indian uh, companies to kind of look at when it comes to uh, accelerating uh, growth uh not just looking inward as we have traditionally been doing so as you mentioned first few years of our decades of our uh country we kind of looked pretty inward and it was a kind of a protectionist mindset with which we we went about things and then 1991 uh, saw the first break where a uh, little out of the box thinking got us to accelerate and of course that journey continues and further acceleration will then bring the true potential of india uh, forward so thank you on behalf of pafi for your uh, uh, vision and the road map that you kind of laid out for india and uh, we uh, we are very encouraged with your uh, high sense of optimism in terms of the future uh, india is going to be one of the focal points of the global economy uh not just for our own selves but also to serve uh as we say uh the next 5 or 6 billion you know the first first billion in the world have been served by you know some of the other countries who have gone ahead but i think the real opportunity ahead in the future is to serve the next 5 or 6 billion in which india can play a tremendously pivotal role uh and that's what you kind of articulated in your speech today to all of us i want to thank uh you for again for you know giving us those insights uh, and you bring about a very rare combination of uh, diplomacy combined with commerce uh, which is which is exactly the the right combination in the times that we are in at this point in time uh, and also to all the participants who who went through this session thank you for listening and contributing with your queries and questions uh, that you had for mr ravi 
uh on behalf of pafi again i want to thank the participants for uh, attending today and i will end the session with a wish for a restful weekend as we go into the saturday sunday break and wish for karma puja which is today so thank you once again everyone and i leave it and uh to uh, to if there are any further queries they can of course write to deepak uh, our president and uh, we will certainly be in touch with you mr ravi and we would definitely actively engage as pafi with you uh, in uh, the collective endeavor of our group companies uh, members uh, as we endeavor to accelerate ourselves indeed in turn accelerate uh, the pace for india collectively thank you once again and uh, wish everybody a very good night bye bye thank you thank you thank you so much bye for now goodbye sorry i i was just trying to attend and finish a webinar how are you all good oh, i'm sorry that day i had to uh, regret at the last minute but it was such a fiasco it was yeah he could not come himself it is can't go down oh my so what is the no i know how did it go it was good but what it was i